So the topic today is sustainability driven fifth industrial revolution. So it's a concept that I started promoting when I was 16 years old to kind of prove the thesis that you can actually make more money if you do more good to the world. But the time when I started, nobody believed in the power of a sustainability led revolution because at that point in time, there was a big portion of people who believed that um, if you're a businessman, you need to just focus on profits. And there was the other side of the world operating in a second silo, which was a charity driven world, which believed that you to, to change the world or to, to have a prof or to have a purpose, there needs to be a separate world, which is backed by charity. But I did not find a lot of people working at the intersection of both those worlds. And that's when I started my entrepreneurial journey. And I wanted to kind of prove the messaging at a fairly large scale that sustainability at one point in time is going to start defining profitability. Uh, fast forward 15 years, I think a big portion of the world has now started believing in the fact that sustainability will define profitability. So anybody watching this, I think the first thing is if you need to um, fairly understand that is really sustainability defining profitability and do you think it would define profitability in the years to come? So if you look back in time, right, um, you need to look at the way web transitions have happened. So if you go back in time and see web one, um, we go back 1991 and we see uh, there was a, if you look, look, uh, read the New York Times, it said there is a new fad in the market called the internet. You saw by 2005 what internet did. It was a read only mechanism, but it definitely changed the world. Uh, then web two came into existence, um, which is pretty much uh, social media came into existence which connected us all together. And that's how it became read and write. So web one was read, web two was read and write. And now we are at an epicenter of another revolution, which is a web three revolution, where we say read, write and own. So my firm belief is that sustainability is going to define profitable, uh, profitability and that's the fifth industrial revolution. That's where we say that profits and purpose are going to coexist. So if you have a purpose, you end, you'll end up making more money. Uh, than you would if you won't have a purpose. So if you look in COVID times, right, uh, you saw healthcare startups receiving the most money. You see edutech startups receiving the most money. You see any startup which was focusing on, um, on, on sustainability uh, received the most money. Now, why did it start to happen? When we often say that venture capitalists are often referred to as vulture capitalists, but why did it, why did it start to happen? This started to happen because people and VCs specifically realized that in the long run, which and then you see the last 15 years, the world, the way the world is shaping up, sustainability will start defining profitability and it's already started to do so. If you look at Tesla's valuation, the way it jumped up during COVID, it's massive. If you see other companies, the way they did, it was insanely amazing. And that's all happened because sustainability is going to start defining profitability and it's already started to do it. So one part is the belief in the idea of a fifth industrial revolution. That one part is that we believe that it's going to come in and the transition from a fourth industrial revolution, which by the way, has given us amazing technology, whether it be AI, 3D printing, um, um, you know, all, all sorts of technology um, has come into play. But on the other side, fifth industrial revolution, there's going to be a transition where we say there's going to be a change from a for profit economy to a for benefit economy. That's why a fifth industrial revolution is a need of the hour. Web3 is going to just power it. Web3, as I mentioned, it's all about decentralization. So once we all believe that fifth industrial revolution is going to come in, then we obviously think about how do you manifest it and how do you actually achieve it? So Web3 and sustainability, I believe, are going to go hand in hand. There are 17 global goals of sustainable development of the United Nations. SDG3, for instance, talks about health. SDG4 talks about education. SDG5 talks about gender equality. SDG6 talks about clean water and sanitation. SDG13 talks about energy, climate. But how do you actually achieve those goals? I've been trying to work on those goals for a long part now, uh, before I started building the company I run now called FIRE. Um, and, and I figured out that the best way to expedite progress towards the UN 17 global SDG goals is Web3 and blockchain. And the reason I figured out was because it's completely you own the data. Basically, what I mean is there are two parts uh, to this whole piece. One is data, the other is finance. In Web3 versus Web2, you end up owning your own data, owning your own finances, which basically means it has the power or it has the ability to give the power back to the community, which did not happen in the era of Web1 and Web2. That's why Web3 is a need of the hour. It's going to change the way world works. 
It's going to change the way any supply chain works. It's going to change the way any financial transaction works. You saw in the news, a lot of people are now talking about central bank digital currency. So that's going to change the way the finance currently operates. Um, if you talk about the way data is stored, it's currently stored on the cloud, but you don't own your data, right? There are a lot of privacy measures here, which are being violated by a lot of Web2 companies. But when you get to Web3 and then you put all the data on the blockchain, then you get to own all your data. Now, how do you achieve the fifth industrial revolution if you believe in it? I think that's when we talk about, I think, four pillars here. So one is, of course, innovation. It's a new canvas. It's a blank slate. Now, one part which I really like about this space, um, see, this is the ninth company I'm building. I've built eight companies before this. Nowhere, none of those companies and all my friends run a lot of companies. I've never figured out a place where um, there is democratization of opportunities and, and talent. So if you're good, and versus somebody who went to a Harvard Business School, there is no discrimination. That's how we've hired people in FIRE. There is no discrimination. That's never happened in, in any of the companies that were built. If you, if you go and appear in a job interview in any of the companies, there is big discrimination that generally happens based on where you, where you went to studies, where, where you did, uh, got educated, which family you came from. In Web3, there's nothing like that because it's an open canvas, which basically means that um, uh, it's an open slate which means that nobody nobody can claim to know the best. Um, I mean, I've built a company and, and I can't say that I know the best in Web3. Nobody can because there is no formal education of Web3 which is present in any of the institutes, which basically also brings you back to the point that innovation and your ability to take your mind to the next level is amazing in this space. So I think the first part that, is, uh, that I would like to speak about is innovation. Is I think if you're building anything in Web3, if you're building anything in the fifth industrial revolution, you, you're building something for the future. Um, obviously, everything's happening now, meaning the whole supply chain, all the Web2 companies are now starting to transition to Web3, and people are now starting to believe in the idea that sustainability is going to define profitability, which means there's a lot of money coming into the space, um, and, and there is a lot of relationship capital being moved, there's a lot of human capital. So I believe, you know, in the whole revolution, there are three types of capital which are being moved at length. One is relationship capital, the second is human capital, and the third is financial capital. Um, we started a company in August 2021 last year. We raised more than $100 million in, in less than a year. I don't think it's easily possible if you were to operate in a Web2 space and, and if you're not operating in sustainability. So that basically proves the messaging that it is going to define profitability. That's why the money is kind of started to come in. Now, if you want to build a startup in this space, then you first need to realize that innovation is the key. Because you're operating on a blank slate, you can let your mind go wherever and you can think uh, any sort of idea, it can be executed in this space. I think that's the best, best thing which can happen for anybody starting a business. Um, there are no set rules. You can break any of those rules. You can start a business. Uh, Second is, I think, Web3 and genius. So when I say genius, I mention about human capital. That, so right now, most of the best talent, I mean, I keep meeting a lot of talent as I keep traveling the world, and I figured out a lot of people want to enter Web3. Anybody who, who, who probably has an IQ of more than 140 and 150, they want to enter this space because it's a new space. You can explore anything, and you can build anything, and anything you build might end up becoming the next Google, right? So. Um, because in 1991 or 1995, nobody knew Google is going to be as big as it is. In 2008, 2009, nobody knew Facebook is, Facebook is going to be as big as it is. For imagine for a 21 or a 22 year old trying to start up a company, you're operating in a space where you know you have the ability to build the next Google. So that's why Web3 for young people is very, very, very important and it's going to change the world. Um, I mentioned about technology. So, you know, one part is you need to be innovative because I think whenever you start a Web3 company, you need to have a white paper. Um, for that, you need a lot of innovation. It has, the idea needs to be something different than what, what currently exists. Then second, you know, uh, you need to hire a lot of people in your team. You need to bring a lot of people together to bring the, uh, to take the idea to fruition. I think that's, that's where a lot of human capital kicks in. That's where the genius kind of comes in. You need a lot of people who are smarter than you. So I think that's something which is which is very important. Now, Web3 and blockchain, what, what ideally it's doing, it's kind of changing the way um, the whole value creation happens. So here I've written, it changes, it changes, uh, it brings you a global shift from value capture economy to a value creation economy. Now, what do I mean by this? Is that if you uh, look at any traditional system, there are a lot of middlemen involved 
um, whether it comes to the transfer of data or the transfer of finance. And, and the, the new world order, the way it's going to look like, it is the middleman needs to be eliminated. Because that's how you create an economy where value is given to shareholders or stakeholders who deserve the most. If you talk about a farmer today, right? So the way the produce happens from the manufacturing side to the time you end up consuming the end product, a lot of money is being lost and a lot of money is being consumed by middlemen. Now, what that means, if you put everything on the blockchain, right? You, through a smart contract, have the ability to code it in a way that you can incentivize each stakeholder or each shareholder in the ability that needs to be uh, that ne they needs to be incentivized. So uh, then blockchain lends you the whole piece of accountability, security, transparency, and trust. So imagine today you transferring any amount of money to your friend, but you have the ability to control where the finance actually goes. So basically meaning like if today I transfer $100 to one of my friends, if the transaction is on a blockchain, I can even get to know where that $100 was or $100 was spent. Now put that use case into the whole um, philanthropy side or the whole uh, the economic perspective and you realize that the use cases go into hundreds of thousands of use cases. We are currently running a program where we're bringing a lot of Dev2 companies into Web3. We're reporting data and finance from Dev2 companies to Web3 companies. And it's insane the way uh, the, the companies are now moving because a lot of companies are now jumping the bandwagon because they know um, this is the best time to actually jump into the Web3 revolution because there is, there is a need of more accountability, security, transparency and trust. So we currently also work with, for instance, um, government, uh, uh, government, sorry. Uh, so when you, when you talk about, say, we're working currently with the Goa police. Now what we do there is imagine the ability to track an FIR as, a, as an end, end, end person who's, who's doing it, right? So you can actually track what's the status of the FIR. You don't need to go to the police station. Imagine putting all the real estate records on the blockchain. You don't need to figure out um, whether that property or the real estate you're buying uh, have, has has some problem, there's some sanctions against it, or, or who was the first owner, who's the second owner. We brought auto companies uh, on the blockchain, which basically means you can actually track your vehicle health on the blockchain. This basically means you can track anything related to mileage, who was the first owner, second owner, um, you know, uh, where the car was used, where the car went. Imagine putting all the degrees on blockchain. Nobody can take anything, right? Today, uh, you're interviewing somebody and somebody tells you, I went to a Harvard Business School back in 2001. When you go to a LinkedIn, you need to hire external agencies to kind of get the background check. When you put everything on the blockchain, everything becomes very transparent. You don't need to hire anybody or the middle the middle part, right? So the middle piece actually gets eliminated. So that saves you a lot of money. That brings you a lot of trust and brings you more accountability and security. Uh, of course, the system now coming in are also, also hacking proof, which basically means it's way better when it comes to, um, comes to uh, security. Uh, one piece that, you know, I think a big part that is, that's going to happen when Web3 and sustainability actually kick in um, is of course, as I mentioned about the UN SDGs. So I think it's it's going to it's going to propel us into a Web3 sustainable revolution and change the world from a for-profit economy um, to a for-benefit economy. Now, how once we believe that Web3 is going to change the world, now point comes the point of call to action for anybody watching this. How do you actually do it? I think there's only one way to do it, which is entrepreneurship. I already mentioned that entrepreneurship in Web3 is very different from the way it used to be in Web2. You don't need to go to a Harvard Business School. You don't need to go to an IIT to study. You can actually start from your home. You don't need to put any money. This is the only sector. You don't need a lot of money to start. Um, that's very easy to, to raise money uh, in the market because there are very few projects which have utility. If you have good utility, good white paper, good token economic document, if you kind of figure out what you're going to do in the Web3 space, I think it's very easy to build a business compared to the other businesses. Now, I'm just kind of, you know, once you decide that if you really want to enter the Web3, um, then I just kind of was thinking, what could be the toolkit? What what would it look like if, if some young kid wants to enter the Web3 space? And I figured some of these things, right? So I think one big piece, as I mentioned, is innovation because it's a blank slate. You're creating on a completely blank slate. Once you believe that blockchain is going to change the world, uh, probably rewind and see the video why I'm saying so. Once you do so, then I think the next step would be to write a white paper. It should be innovative. It should be different than what currently exists in the market. 
um, build a good token economics document. Then after that, once before you start building technology, I think the best part is how can you bring genius and how can you bring amazing people to build technology with you? You can't do it alone. It's a revolution, as I mentioned, fifth industrial revolution and web three would require a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs. So everybody needs to come together. And the last part is adoption and community. So once you build the technology, the space you're in, we've ended up building uh, one of the fastest growing blockchain unicorns. We did it in 11 months, but now our journey is really started. Now for us, it's all about adoption. How do we get more people to believe in the idea? How do we get more people? We are a layer one system. So of course we want everybody to use the blockchain, but you could be anybody starting a layer two solution or a layer one. But once you uh, once you've started in the space, the idea is how to can you activate the community to do it. Um, I think the time is running out. I I would like to again reinstill the message that Web three sustainable revolution has already started. I think it's time to join the revolution, become a part of it. Thank you.